Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to another colloquium. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for attending the 2023-2024 VIU Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series. My name is Leon Potter. I am the chair of the theater department here, and I am very thankful to do to say that uh, we are currently standing on the traditional territories of the Sleeping uh, First Nations, and where we get to work, research, and do really interesting talks like this, which is fantastic. So thank you all very much for being here today. I would also like to acknowledge the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. Claire Grogan, for her, on her behalf, um, and I'd like to thank her on behalf of the Colloquium Committee for her ongoing support, and which is crucial to its success and for making this such a valuable asset to the university. Right now, I would like to introduce uh, Morgan Taylor, who is a BIU student and focusing on Indigenous literature, to come up stage and introduce our guest speaker for today. Thank you very much. Welcome, Morgan. Morgan Hello. Good morning. Greetings to all staff, fellow students, and honored guests. My name is Morgan Taylor. I am a first year student from Professor Bryn Skibo's English 117 course last semester and English 127 course this semester. As a non-Indigenous person myself, these classes have encouraged me to learn more in depth about the Indigenous territories, which I'm privileged to live and learn on. I am from Guernacoué, Ontario. Guernacoué is a French and Haudenosaunee language name, meaning town on two rivers. And so as I choose to introduce myself to you today in Kenyaka Gehak, the language of all people. Bryn illustrates in her classes the importance and depth of knowledge to be gained from the study and adoption of indigenous narratives. You'll get a peek into her classrooms this morning as she utilizes Anishinaabe Minobat Madzawayan, or the way of the good life, to read Margaret Atwood's speculative novel, Mad Adam. Bryn has completed her doctoral studies and one year postdoctoral research project at the University of Geneva, specializing in narratology, animal studies, indigenous studies, and vegan studies. Her dissertation analyzed the narrative performance of interspecies relationality through interdisciplinary framework comprised of posthumanism and Anishinaabe epistemontologies through Genetian narratology. She is also the senior book reviews editor for Transmotion, a peer reviewed and open access journal publishing critical essays, reviews, and creative writing on contemporary indigenous literatures. She has also published and presented on indigenous literature, animal studies, post humanism, post structuralism, new journalism, and narratology. Please welcome with me Professor Vincibo. Greetings to you, to you all, to all of my relatives. It's a good morning. My name is Brinskibo, and that's my dog, Bonnie. I do not have a clan. I am American. I come from California. Thank you to the Sinemuk Nation on whose traditional territory we are able to meet today and discuss these views. So this colloquium will cover a lot of material and I hope that I will present it in a good way. One that is respectful to those whose worldviews and language I am discussing, interesting and educational to my audience and helpful and guiding to my students. I will focus on the worldviews of the Ojibwe people who may get part of this, that might help. I will focus on the worldviews of the Ojibwe people who make up part of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy, alongside the Potawatomi and the Ottawa. Going forward, I will use the word Ojibwe, but please note that Ojibwe and Anishinaabe are often used interchangeably, and that the Potawatomi and the Ottawa are also part of the Anishinaabe Confederacy. In this talk, I will introduce some of the worldviews of the Ojibwe, such as Minogamatsuin, the way of the good life, and I will discuss the Ojibwe language called Ojibwe Moin, and how it repeats and represents the worldview of Minogamatsu. 
I will also, of course, talk about Margaret Atwood and her speculative fiction trilogy, focusing on the third and final novel, Mad Adam. I will use Ojibwe worldviews and my very limited understandings of Ojibwe Nguyen to offer an interpretation of a particular scene from Mad Adam. In doing so, I hope to offer insight into this popular novel and a path to other scholars on how to use, respectfully, indigenous worldviews as literary critical theory. Finally, I will also discuss why I think using indigenous worldviews as literary critical theory is a good idea and what can be and what doing so can offer for scholars, indigenous and settler alike. I'd like to start though with a discussion about cultural appreciation versus cultural appropriation. This is a very tricky balance that I as a white scholar working in native studies think about a lot. You'll have noticed that I introduced myself following traditional protocol and in Ojibwe Nguyen. Introducing myself like this wasn't an easy decision. The language isn't mine by family or adoption. I don't speak it fluently and I'm not learning it through the guidance of a teacher or an elder. My knowledge is through self-education from speakers like James Vuklik Kagegaba, Margaret Newton, and Nigan Waiwidan Sinclair, as well as through educational websites, speeches, books, social media, and yes, there is an app for that. Also, as many of us know, Ojibwe Moen, along with most indigenous languages in North America, was the target of state-sponsored erasure. Residential schools across North America forcibly banned and punished Ojibwe children from speaking their language. Many fluent speakers lost the desire and or the ability to speak Ojibwe Moen, a language that had been heard for millennia down the American East Coast and throughout Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North and South Dakota. Fortunately though, the language is resurging. Undergraduate and graduate degrees are now available in Ojibwe Moen. Children's books, textbooks, and apps are devoted to teaching it. Poetry and fiction is written exclusively in it. And Ojibwe elders are passing on their fluency to younger generations. The language, along with many other indigenous languages, is blossoming again. So why do I, an Aaron, an American of European ancestry, speak the language to introduce myself. Speaking a language gives insight into the values and the worldviews of the speakers. Ojibwe philosopher Lawrence Gross put it very succinctly, the worldview of the Anishinaabe lives in the language. This is seen, I think, quite clearly by comparing English to Ojibwe Moen. English, as we know, or may not know, is predominantly comprised of nouns. And amongst my students, I would say, what's a noun? Person, place, or thing. Often defined uh, personal objects uh, with static or essential characteristics. So we could form a sentence like, I read a book. There is also generally an expected linear grammatical structure to English, subject, verb, object. I read a book. We may change the order object, verb, subject, but English always has a subject that acts potentially upon an object. There is a clear causal reality. So whether we use passive tense, I read a book, or uh, sorry, active tense, I read a book, or passive tense, the book was read by me, there is always a clear causal relationship between the subject and the object. English speakers also tend to limit subjectivity or personhood to humans. Personification is a literary device that we use in literary studies, which says it's when we give qualities distinct of people to non-human uh, beings. So we would consider thought, communication, intent, emotion. If we give those qualities to a non-human being or object in a text, we call it personification. English speakers also reserve pronouns, he, she, for subjects. Objects, it, are things which can be acted upon, but don't generally have any agency and they don't act upon subjects. I read the book, the book doesn't read me. In contrast to the English predominance of nouns, 70% of Ojibwe Nguyen is verbs, action words. This grammatical difference is more than just semantics. As Gross said, the worldview lives in the language. So when a language is based upon action words, the world is experienced in that language as a process in motion. 
It's not an earth. It's an earthing. I am not Bryn. I Bryn. I am Brinning. I am a process that is always in the process of becoming myself, which is itself a process. She Brins. As Lawrence Gross explains, instead of the book is blue, an Ojibwe an approximation would be the book blues, the book is currently bluing, or very simply, blues with book being attached as a suffix to the verb itself, and you wouldn't even say the word book because it would be implied within the verb. However, what this means is that the book might not always be blue. It's not a static state of being. It is a process of being. So the book may currently be bluing, but if left out in the sun, the book may be become a decaying, a browning, a falling aparting. This change in its nature is a part of its process in the process of booking. <laughs> Grammar is hard. In another example, Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass and student of Potuatame, which is a related language, explains the English word bay as in a body of water. In English, bay is a noun, but Potuatome speakers would use the word wikagama to be a bay. Kimmerer explains that wikagama as a word meaning to be a bay, quote, holds the wonder that for this moment, the living water has decided to shelter itself between these shores because it could do otherwise. It could become a stream, an ocean, or a waterfall. And there are verbs for all of that as well. To be a hill, to be a sandy beach, to be a Saturday, all are possible as verbs only in a world where everything is alive. Speaking of being alive, aside from the predominance of, uh, of verbs, Ojibwe nouns are also different from English. Ojibwe Moyen separates nouns in terms of animacy and inanimacy. Some linguists, however, argue that this idea of animacy and inanimacy should actually be reconsidered in terms of more complex and less complex. Essentially, though, an animate noun or a more complex noun can act upon anyone and anything. An inanimate or less complex noun can only act upon inanimate nouns. So animate or complex nouns are often, but not always occurring naturally. For instance, rock, asin, person, bimadzit, ribbon, beniban. These are generally occurring naturally. And so they are generally going to be animate nouns, but inanimate or less complex nouns are often but not always made by humans. So for example, the word for ribbon, zeniban, is an animate or complex noun, but ribbon skirt, zeniban majibudin, is an inanimate noun. A ribbon can act upon a person, a ribbon skirt cannot. But these categories of animacy and complexity can vary by the speaker. In one sentence, a skirt may be inanimate, but in another sentence, the speaker may decide that in this context, no, it turns out the skirt is acting upon the person. It's very flexible. So if you're thinking, I am confused, grammar is hard, yes, you are in good company. The Guinness Book of World Records ranks Ojibwe Moin as the, quote, most complex language in the world due to its 6,000 more or more verb variations. It is complex, but in its complexity is incredibly precise. These variations, these complexities to the verbs are due in part to the prefixes and suffixes attached to a verb depending on what's happening with and around it. So when an Ojibwe Moin speaker speaks about an animate or inanimate noun, that animacy will change the suffix, the n, that is attached to the verb. Why do we care about this? Since humans and other animals and trees and plants are all animate nouns, they receive the same animate verb suffix. What this means is that you would speak about your mother or your brother with the same verb suffix that you would use for a tree, mitig, or wolf, maingan, because they are all animate. They are all living and they are all an equal part of creation. Grammatically, the language reminds us they are all family and they are all subjects, not objects. 
Ojibwe Moen requires and reminds its readers that the world around us is comprised of our human and non-human family. We speak of rocks, asinig, the same way grammatically that we speak of humans, bamadzit. In fact, some rocks, who or which, are chosen to be used in ceremonies such as sweat lodges are called nokamis, which is the same word you would use to call your grandfather. So to summarize, Ojibwe Mwen reminds us that the world around us is itself a living process. It's an earthing. You yourself are a living process. You are a becoming of yourself. This earth, this earthing is also comprised of living agential beings, whether or not they look or speak or appear as humans. This is not personification. This is instead an understanding that personhood exists beyond what we consider to be the human. So back to my introduction. I introduced myself in Ojibwe Moen as a way to show respect and to give thanks to the Ojibwe people whose worldviews are encompassed in their language, as well as their stories and ceremonies, all of which have profoundly impacted and redirected my research. I am learning Ojibwe Moen so that I can understand the worldview better, but also very simply so that these words are spoken again, even if I do not always get the pronunciation correct every time. But I am very aware of the irony of a settler speaking a language which was banned to its speakers for decades. And I am also very aware of the damage colonialism has had and still has on the language's existence today. My navigation of this awareness is part of the precarious balance that reconciliation requires as we try to walk together in a good way. So speaking of walking, you may have noticed my ribbon skirt, my Zeniba Majibudin. Whoops, sorry. I won't go too far. Uh, you may have noticed my ribbon skirt, my Zeniba Majibudin. Ribbon skirts are centuries old garments stemming from interactions between indigenous communities and French fur traders. They are considered sacred by some, and they're typically worn for ceremonies or spiritual events. So I consider this a ceremony as I am speaking about the Ojibwe worldviews and sacred beliefs. Some Ojibwe women believe that you should only wear a ribbon skirt that you have been gifted, but Zeniban Majibudin are also experiencing a cultural resurgence in pop culture. They are seen on VIU campuses as well as on the red carpet and fashion runways, with work by native designers like Delina White and Jamie Okuma. Delina White, owner of Anishina I Am Anishinaabe, made this skirt, which I bought several years ago. When I saw it, I was struck by the evident artistry as well as the symbolic significance that had been woven into the skirt. It's made of Pendleton blankets, copper weaving, mother of pearl, which are all symbolic signs of home, health, and spiritual protection. But I don't wear it very often. I tend to wear it to ceremony, like today. Because, much like speaking a language that's not mine, there is a fine line between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. I never feel comfortable or especially confident wearing this skirt. And for me, that's the point. Perhaps the always present concern I feel when I introduce myself in Ojibwe Moen or when I wear a, a ceremonial skirt, perhaps that's necessary. It's this constant questioning of, am I appreciating or am I appropriating? I wanna take this thought and offer it to non-Indigenous scholars who are working in Indigenous studies to say, I think we should always be feeling this sense of potential discomfort and being aware of this fine line that we walk and we should always be doing everything that we can to stay to the right side of it. And we can do that by informing ourselves, by doing our research respectfully and thoughtfully, by asking communities involved and never assuming we have the right to anything that is not ours. Ribbon, Zeniban, and person, Bimadizid, are both animate complex nouns. We can both act upon each other. This makes sense to me. The ribbons actively tell me when I walk in them, they're heavy, they make noise. They remind me to step carefully and respectfully when I work with a language, a worldview, and stories that aren't mine. This is how I navigate cultural appropriation, and this is a process I think about a lot when I consider Margaret Atwood's novels through an Ojibwe critical lens. 
So some of you, especially the class in the back, some of you may be familiar already with Margaret Atwood due to her wild success with The Handmaid's Tale, both as a novel and as a TV show. Like The Handmaid's Tale, Mad Adam is a trilogy. Uh, Mad Adam and the Trilogy is a work of speculative fiction, which focuses on future social collapse due to capitalism, climate change, and a bioengineered pandemic. My doctoral research focused on human-animal relations, and I planned on writing a chapter using the very standard Euro-American critical framework to interpret Atwood's use of narrative structure, time, figurative language, etc. When that chapter was done, I planned on reading a work by Ojibwe novelist Louise Erdrich through also a Euro-American critical framework. People like Jacques Derrida, Gilles Deleuze, Donna Haraway, these French and American philosophers are the standards of literal, literary critical theory that focuses on human and animals. So my addition to them, my use of their lens to read an Ojibwe author's work wasn't considered entirely normal and appropriate. But, and this might resonate with some students who are writing right now, I got stuck. For nine long months, I had nothing to say. My argument and interpretations about Mad Adam to me just felt really boring. Capitalism is bad, the environment is tanking, humans consume everything. It had all been said before and it didn't feel especially new. Plus, there was some stuff in Atwood's novel that I fundamentally just didn't understand. She significantly changes the structure in this third novel. I did not understand why or what it meant. Um, there was stuff that I thought probably was important, but I didn't get why it was important. In short, I was stuck. So I stopped. I had to start planning my new class on Louise Erdrich's novels. Erdrich is an enrolled member of Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe. I didn't plan on using Ojibwe worldviews in my dissertation, but I did want to understand the Ojibwe perspective that she was referring to in her novels, and I wanted to teach this to my students in Switzerland. So I read historical materials, I studied maps, I studied Ojibwe philosophy, aspects of the language, transcripts of traditional and sacred stories, and retellings, contemporary retellings of these stories. In doing so, yes, I gained insight into what Erdrich was doing and how her novels worked. But the thing I didn't expect was that I also began to read Atwood's novel differently. <laughs> I started to look more closely at her use of personification and metaphor and what we call discontinuous narrative, which is when the narrative shifts back and forth in time between different people in time and different people in spaces. I also looked at her use of what Russian formalist Mikhail Bakhtin calls multi-voice discourse. These narrative aspects weren't at all similar to what Erdrich was doing, but an Ojibwe lens showed me a different way to interpret Atwood's writing. And most importantly, an Ojibwe critical lens gave me insight that I had not found with my previous European American critical lens. This Ojibwe lens highlighted and explained the significance of parts of the novels that I previously hadn't seen or that I had previously considered unimportant. And so after this failure of my nine months, my dissertation radically changed direction Instead of applying a strictly Euro-American critical lens to Canadian and indigenous novels, I instead applied both European and American and indigenous critical lenses to solely a Canadian novel, well, trilogy. Some of you familiar with Margaret Atwood may understand though that she is a complicated choice for an indigenous framework due to, for instance, the accusations of indigenous erasure and cultural appropriation, as seen in works like her 1970 collection of poetry, The Journals of Susanna Moody, her 1972 novel, Surfacing, and her canonical discussion of Canadian literature called Survival, published in 1972. She also briefly gained notoriety in 2017 for supporting the claims of indigenous Identity made by Joseph Boyden and Stephen Galloway. That's a long conversation. So regardless of whether or not these men are indigenous, my point is Atwood is in no position to support these claims because she is not indigenous and she is not speaking on behalf of any indigenous community. But her support of these claims is also for Atwood unusual because she discusses this very issue of claiming identity or what she calls claiming kin in an Oxford lecture series. 
In the series, she says that, quote, many white Canadians claim as a matter of pride some Indian blood, perhaps to convince themselves that the land they live on is one they ought to be living in. Atwood acknowledges that there seems little chance that non-Indigenous Canadians will stop making fake claims regarding their desired, if pretend, Indigenous identity. However, she hopes that one potential benefit of doing this would result in a trend where if white Canadians would adopt a more traditionally Native attitude towards the natural world, a less exploitive and a more respectful attitude, they might be able to reverse the galloping environmental carnage of the late 20th century and salvage for themselves some of that wilderness they keep saying they identify with and need. Alice's conclusion is a tad problematic for its apparent acceptance of indigenous identity theft. However, I do agree with her more subtle point regarding the need and the value of bringing indigenous attitudes or philosophies into Canadian and American ways of seeing and being in the world. Indigenous scholars like Scott Andrews, Jody Bird, Glenn Coltard, Vine Deloria Jr., Lawrence Gross, Quace Quentin, Audra Simpson, Ines Talmatent, I'm sorry, Talamentes, and Zoe Todd, among many others, have all made similar claims. A common agreement among them is that the act of using indigenous theories and philosophies with and alongside Euro-American philosophies will lead to the decolonization of academic fields like the unfortunately named post-colonialism or Marxism, to name just a few. Decolonizing these fields may also help to strengthen the lateral, or sorry, to strengthen the solidarity and representation of oppressed groups against uh, of oppressed groups, as opposed to the lateral violence which sometimes pits these groups against each other as they all fight for recognition from the colonizing nation. It seems then that despite Atwood's perhaps troubled relationship with indigeneity, reading her novel in terms of Ojibwe philosophies would have a variety of benefits. One such benefit would be that the careful use of Ojibwe worldviews, language, and stories alongside more conventional Euro-American theoretical frameworks does the important work of decolonizing academic theory. It rewrites outdated notions of who produces theory and about whom. So for example, for far too long, the accepted means of developing one's literary critical framework in a Western academic system was to do your readings in standard classical Greek and Roman philosophers, read the European Marxists, read the Russian formalists, the French post-structuralists, etc. This is the path that I was encouraged to follow in my bachelor's, master's, and PhD at the University of Switzerland, which is a standard European university. It's a standard European approach. It was then standard practice to apply these philosophies to other not necessarily Greek, Roman, or European works of literature. Even in my doctoral defense, I was asked, why didn't I just read Margaret Atwood's novels through a Western lens in terms of Greek or Roman mythology? Why turn to Ojibwe mythology? I stated, perhaps a little cheekily because it had been three hours of defending myself by this point, Margaret Atwood's not Greek. She's a Canadian living in Toronto or Tsitakranto, which is the traditional territory of the Ojibwe, as well as the Mississauga, Mississauga the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. I argue reading out his work in terms of Ojibwe worldviews seems more relevant, not less. And as we know, representation matters. Just as Tsitakranto has now relabeled its street names in Ojibwe when to remind its citizens that they are on Ojibwe land, so too is it important to use Ojibwe critical theory to read the work of one of the most famous writers today living on traditional Ojibwe territory. Another more specific benefit would be that Ojibwe worldviews can clarify Outwood's maybe vague statement regarding the need to adopt a quote, more traditionally native attitude towards the natural world. We can do this by referring to actual native beliefs and worldviews as opposed to stereotypes or generalizations. So in total then, reading Matt Adam through an Ojibwe lens offers a valuable and relevant means to interpret Adwood's ecological text.
So that's the why behind my choice. I've talked to you about the actual native beliefs and now I wanna offer a bit more detail as to what they are. So when I say Ojibwe worldviews, I have been thinking of a term that I'll now use here and going forward. Mino Bamadzuin or the way of the good life. Mino, first off, means good. Bamadzi means to live or to be alive. And win simply means it's a state of being. It turns a verb into a noun. Bamadzid means person in Ojibwe Moin, but also within Bamadzi, Ojibwe linguists, linguists have traced roots and relations to words and verbs relating to movement along a path, following a trail or a way, swimming in a current, and being blown along by the wind. Ojibwe philosopher Darcy Riol explains that within Bamadzid, a fluent Ojibwe Mwen speaker will hear a flowing sense of living in rhythm with others, going with the ebb and flow of nature. This flowing sense of living in rhythm with others is Mino Bamadzuin. Mino Bamadzuin is also the all-encompassing philosophy, the moral and aesthetic ideal, the way of seeing and understanding the world for the Ojibwe people. What this means is Mino Bamadzuin tells the Ojibwe what is good and what is bad, what is beautiful, how to live well, and how to know and interpret the physical and metaphysical reality around us. So to walk in the good path or to stay right within Mino Bamadzuin, To walk the good path or to stay right within Mino Bamatsuin is to maintain good relations with all of life and to promote the continuance of life. So when I say, Bonjour in Binoy Maganadok, hello to all of my relatives, I am saying hello to all of you, my relatives, my colleagues, my friends, as well as the cedar, Kijigag, the rabbits, Wabozig, the eagles, Mizigiziwag, and even the rocks, Asanak. These are also my relations, and I must treat them with respect because I live in interdependence with them. I speak of and with them in the same grammar that I would use to speak of and with my human family. Mino Bamatsuin offers a comprehensive way of seeing and being in, in an interconnected relationship with the world. The philosophy is evident from the Ojibwe creation story in which Kichi Manitou, the great mystery, has a dream vision of all creation and decides upon meditation that it must be made. In making the sun, the moon, the stars and earth, the trees, flowers, grasses and vegetables, the walking, flying, swimming and crawling beings, Kichi Manitou gives a piece of themselves to all creation. Thus, everything in creation has a unique purpose, it has a unique gift. We recognize that all have been given a gift from creator, thus they all have a subsequent role to play in creation. Thus, all are equal within creation. Humans are made last and we are reliant upon our animal and plant relatives to keep us healthy and alive. Death is an aspect of life. Death is present in creation. This means some may eventually die so that others may live. This balance of life and death applies to animals, plants, and humans. But humans do not have the right to take without asking. We must acknowledge if permission has been denied, and we should receive the gift of a sacrifice, be it from a plant or an animal. We must receive that gift of sacrifice with respect, thanks, and ceremony. Maintaining respect for and the balance of creation is Mino Bamadzuin. Darcy Riel describes creation as the unity, balance, and harmony of all the parts set within a temporal cycle of generation, growth, death, and regeneration. An Ojibwe worldview shaped by the stories and language sees the world in terms of interconnectivity, balance, and constant process and flux. This worldview is significantly different from the Euro-American worldview, which has been shaped by Greek and Roman philosophy and Christian ideology. 
An Ojibwe worldview emphasizes interspecies balanced within, quote, a peopled universe. Humans are recognized as the youngest, most dependent creatures who rely on the natural world to survive. The plants and non-human beings are persons with their own gifts, purposes, and intentions. In a Christian worldview, humans are also created last, but as stated in Genesis 1.26, humans are created in God's image and the natural world is created for humans to quote, rule over. Between the Ojibwe and the Christian creation stories, the chronology of creation is the same, but one emphasizes interdependence and kinship, while the other one emphasizes stewardship in some translations and domination and rule in other translations. It's due to this difference, I think, that applying Ojibwe lens worldviews as a critical lens to Margaret Atwood's ecological disaster novel offers a particularly important and unique insight. So off to the books. If you're not familiar with the novel, Mad Adam is the third and final installment of Margaret Atwood's speculative fiction trilogy, which begins with Orcs and Crake in 2003, its sequel, The Year of the Flood from 2009. The first two novels take place in the mid 2000s when North America is suffering the effects of extreme climate change from floods and droughts to heat and animal extinction. At the same time, North American capitalism has been extrapolated to its logical, if terrifying, conclusion, with society drastically split between a wealthy scientific class who live in gated compounds, while the rest of the less gifted population, including the humanists, we live down here in the anarchic slums. In light of this social, economic, and environmental degradation, the titular Crake, a gifted scientist, believes that the Earth's ecosystems will soon collapse, and he has the evidence for it. This would lead to the death of most humans, as well as the death of most everything. And so, he very kindly bioengineers a plague to kill all human life except for his best friend Jimmy, and a race of human-animal hybrids called the Krakers. Making humans go extinct, Crake believes, will give the rest of the planet a chance to survive. The first and second novels are both narrated by characters who are emotionally, psychologically, and physically scarred, both before and after the pandemic takes place. This scarring is a result of the narrator's struggles to survive in a future America split between the haves and the have-nots. The narrators of the first and second novels isolate themselves from other humans and non-humans in order to try to prevent more trauma. They do this both before the pandemic hits and definitely after the pandemic hits. This before and after isolation by the narrators is illustrated and performed by the novel's use of past and present tense. The, the chapters regularly and predictably alternate between the past and the present, the before the plague and the after the plague. However, in the first two novels, the past eventually catches up with and collides with the present. The narrative pattern created through the alternation of the two narrators' past-present discourses eventually breaks down and converges, which is what I've tried to indicate in the red and in the orange at the end. If you can trace the dotted line, that's the past. It converges with the present. Mm -hmm. The pattern created through the alternation of the two narrators' past and present tense discourses eventually breaks down and reconverges in a reunited voice telling the story from the same place and time. I and other scholars have argued that this discontinuous narrative structure demonstrates that the narrators attempted self-isolation, isolation in terms of time, past and present, and isolation in terms of keeping myself away from others is both untenable, it can't be maintained, and it's harmful. It's untenable because the distinct voices eventually come together in unity and emotional intimacy, and is harmful because to the individual, to the society, and to the planet, all are damaged by the characters and the society's refusals to act as a community. However, as my students have pointed out to me very angrily in the past, both novels fail 
to provide a satisfactory ending. They end on a question. What will the narrator do? What is the good or moral action in a life or death situation? How do the characters stay safe when the world around them demands action, literally to commit murder in order to help somebody else, but their actions could be wrong? The novels fail to provide a definitive ending. Instead, they conclude with questions of how to behave in this world. As a result, the first two novels leap open to interpretation about which mindset will win out in the post-apocalyptic world, a continuation of isolation as self-preservation or an adoption of interdependence as preservation. The choice remains open until Mad Adam. Matt Adam picks up where Craig and Flood leave off. The survivors of the pandemic, who are a group of former scientists, bioterrorists, and members of an eco-Christian cult, attempt to maintain and create rigid boundaries between themselves and the increasingly undomesticated world around them. The sprawling cities are being demolished by flourishing plant life. Human exceptionalism and human dominance over the environment has been replaced with rapidly increasing populations of lab engineered hybrid animals who hunt the human survivors. The beginning of the novel is also marked by continued attacks on the boundaries of the survivor's compound by two escaped serial rapists, as well as a band of omnivorous pigs who have been modified with human brain tissue, not the people you want not on your side. Caught in the middle, between the human survivors and their would-be hunters are the Krakers, who are a group of peaceful, genetic human-animal hybrids who are reluctantly protected by this band of human survivors. Like the previous novels, Mad Adam is also structured in terms of a discontinuous narrative. It's split between two voices, Zeb, a former bioterrorist who speaks in the past, and Toby, uh, Zeb's lover and a former member of the eco-Christian cult speaking about the present. This past and present balance is interrupted by stories that Toby tells to the Krakers, in which she explains the world around them and expands upon their mythology. Also like the previous novels, Mad Adam initially follows a predictable pattern. It opens with a story to the Krakers told by Toby, which is followed either by Toby's present tense narration or Zeb's past tense narration before finishing with another story to the Krakers by Toby. And that pattern continues and continues and continues. The alternate pattern also mirrors the worldview of the characters and narrators who persistently believe that emotional and physical distancing and isolation are the means to self-preservation. One way to protect yourself, they believe, is to keep the past separate from the present and from the future. Toby tells Zeb at one point, quote, back off from the childhood, you'll get woeful, meaning he should refrain from retelling painful stories about his childhood in order to avoid encountering this emotional trauma again. Initially, Zeb is skeptical about Toby's denial of woe that it has helped her, but eventually he also adopts the same mindset of psychological and emotional avoidance by cutting out one's past. He tells Toby that I hate going back to all that. I had to live it. I don't like reliving it. Together, they try to ignore the effects of the past on their present and on their future. This includes ignoring their own complicity in the plague, as well as their own stunted ability to share emotional and physical intimacy. This idea of distancing oneself from the past and from others also translates into distancing oneself from the non-human world, especially seen with Toby. Toby repeats to herself sermons about ecologically minded saints, and tells herself litanies about remembering the sanctity of all life. Nevertheless, she also rejects her eco-Christian vows of vegetarianism and she starts eating meat again. When she feels jealous over Zeb's affection, she takes pleasure in killing slugs as a proxy for her unexpressed, unmet emotional needs. And though she has been trained as an apiary to talk to the bees in order to gain their respect, trust, and cooperation, 
She feels humiliation and embarrassment when talking to them. Finally, even though she frequently interacts with the Krakers as their nightly storyteller, she can't remember their names, and sometimes she considers them to be only semi-human. Okay, so if you're thinking, some of that doesn't sound so bad. Maybe you eat meat. Maybe you would also feel silly caught talking to bees. I hear you. I don't mean to say that Toby is a bad person or that she's a raging human exceptionalist. She is, in fact, probably the most ecologically minded character amongst the remaining characters. The other character survivors make far more dehumanizing characterizations of the Krakers and they kill non-human animals for their flesh without any guilt whatsoever. Toby is indeed one of the most non-speciesist characters in the entire novel. My point is that even she can't escape a lingering sense of human exceptionalism and a separation from the outside world that which was left over from the pandemic. And indeed, it was this human exceptionalism and separation from the natural world which led to the pandemic in the first place. So in summary then, most of the novel and most of the trilogy is based upon maintaining strict but unstable boundaries between oneself and one's past, oneself and others, and oneself and the non-human world. This isolationist worldview runs entirely counter to an Ojibwe worldview shaped by Minoba Matsuin. Yet, a potent scene of vulnerability and interconnection reveals that the community's anthropocentric beliefs are untenable and unhelpful to their future. And I think reading this scene through an Ojibwe critical lens offers insight into an alternative future path beyond the Western world's view of anthropocentricism. This pivotal scene takes place roughly three quarters into the novel, which I have marked with those uh, lines and the big X. Uh, so it takes roughly three quarters in the novel, which is long enough for the previous past present alternating pattern to now be well established. Leading up to this scene, Toby needs advice regarding a member of the community who may suffer a fatal childbirth. At a loss of what to do, Toby seeks a vision for her from her deceased mentor named Pilar by eating psilocybin mushrooms. Toby then walks with Zeb uh, and Blackbeard, a Quaker boy, and two guards to Pilar's resting place under an elderberry bush. Due to Toby's extreme state of need, the choice will either save or will kill a community member she begins to deconstruct some of these previous rigid boundaries that she had established. This undoing is repeatedly referred to in terms of destruction. Toby tells Zeb that her mushroom formula will cause a low level shakeup, but after the vision, she states that it quote, melted the fortress walls of her worldview. This shakeup and melting shifts previously established ways of understanding reality. Toby reframes Zeb's skepticism regarding her desire to talk to dead people by describing it instead as accessing her inner Pilar. And she tells Blackbeard that she was going to go visit a dear friend, but it's a friend you can't see. In saying these things, she is already moving away from her earlier denial of the past and her avoidance of emotional intimacy. Pilar, a dear but dead friend and trusted mentor, is there. She will be there. The deconstruction and recreation of Toby's worldview continues as she kneels in front of the elderberry bush and mentally communicates with Pilar, thinking, I know you're there in your new body. I need your help. What should I do? She asks Pilar to send me a message, a signal. What would you do in my place? But when she receives no signal or no response, Toby feels abandoned and she realizes that, quote, there is no magic, there are no angels, it was all child's play. The it Toby realizes was magic is the Christian teachings that she received from the eco-Christian cult who trained her to believe that the Christian God and angels were omnipresent in the world around her. The lack of a linguistic response signifies to her that this God is an invention on the part of the cult leader and potentially that there is no Christian God whatsoever. It's, quote, all child's play. 
Toby's realization of godlessness, of humanity's great isolation in, ex in existence, could potentially create a vacuum in one's worldview, a nihilistic descent into the meaningless of life. Sorry, meaninglessness of life. However, the text does offer a response of sorts, and an Ojibwe worldview through Mino Bamadzuin helps to decipher its meaning. At the exact moment that she realizes Pilar or God isn't going to answer, Toby is brought face to face with a giant genetically modified pig and her piglets. These are the same pigs who have repeatedly attempted to kill and eat the remaining band of human survivors. The sight of this impressive hunter at such close proximity causes Zeb and the other men to raise their weapons. But rather than let Zeb shoot the pig as he is ready to do, Toby is now struck with her sought after vision. Instead of hearing some internally internalized version of Pilar's voice as she had hoped and expected, she instead sees the sow as such enormous power. A bullet would never stop the sow. A spray gun burst would hardly make a dent. She could run them down like a tank. Life, 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 full of bursting this minute, second, millisecond, millennium, eon. In this moment, Toby comes face to face with a perception of the world as interconnected and cyclical, a realization that directly contrasts conventional Euro-American worldviews of distinct oppositional categories of human or animal, life or death, past or present. The power that Toby refers to initially appears to be a reference to the animal's strength, which can't be stopped or dented and it is likened to a tank, which is an object and machine of destruction. So the characterization at first reading appears to be anthropocentric. The pig is objectified and seen only in terms of its physicality, in terms of its brute strength. However, Toby then acknowledges the pig's subjectivity, addressing the animal as she rather than it. The use of the female pronoun is important as it foreshadows the shift in the meaning of the pig's enormous power. While the power is initially linked to the animal's ability to kill like a tank, this reference to death is juxtaposed by Toby's uncharacter repetition, uncharacteristic repetition of life, 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 life. This repetition is unique to the novel. Never again does Toby or any other character speak like this. But I want to draw attention to the number of repetitions, five. Five repetitions highlights the sow's regenerative power. She is the mother of five piglets. Five repetitions also highlights the sow's killing power. There are five humans standing in front of her whom she could kill or run down like a tank. So five lives made, five lives potentially taken. The repetition is significant and evocative precisely because of its grammatical ambiguity. It is unclear to whom the repetition refers. The animals, the pigs, and the humans are equally likely to be the implied objects of the phrase and thus are drawn together as mutual particip participants in creation, that is, in life. In English, ambiguity relates them just as in, in Ojibwe Moin, the grammar of animacy reminds us of our non-human relations. The connections between the pigs and the humans goes further as it expands across time. As mentioned in my summary of the novel, Toby had previously warned Zeb against delving too much into his past for fear of reliving the trauma of childhood. All three novels are structured around a discontinuous narrative with distinct splits between the past and the present. This narrative split performs the character's desire to keep the past as the past and the present separate from the past and definitely separate from their potentially unlikely future. However, in this charged scene, Toby sees life as united across the micro and macro macroscopic perspectives of time from the millisecond to the eon. While previously the five repetitions of life, 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 life arguably referred to the physical beings in the space, 
The five repetitions can also be linked to the expanse across time, this minute, second, millisecond, millennium, eon. Under the effects of the psilocybin mushrooms and the pigoon's gaze, Toby's world shifts from a particularized temporal linearity to one reflective of Newtonian physics of cause and effect, subject, verb, object, to a new worldview of quantum temporal simultaneity, where cause and effect, past and a present, are suspended and held together at the same time. As I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, Ojibwe Moin is comprised largely 70% of verbs, as opposed to the English reliance on nouns. <clears throat> The difference is impactful on one's worldview as Ojibwe Moen speakers see the world in flux, a dynamic process, while English speakers see the world as a state of being. The process of to be a bay because it could be otherwise versus the static entity of the bay. In his chapter, The Quantum Nature, Quantum Nature of the Anishinaabe Language, Ojibwe writer Lawrence Gross explains that the boundaries between past and present are different for native speakers of Anishinaabe Moin. In fact, the boundaries are much weaker. Using perhaps an unexpected example, Gross explains that a man, Rob, is someone who smokes, but who intends on quitting in the near future. This would be, in Ojibwe Moin, the present smoker who is also the future non-smoker at the same time. They exist in their future and present and past bodies simultaneously. As Gross explains, the future non-smoking Rob exists simultaneously with the current smoking Rob in the ongoing process of quitting smoking. The emphasis is on the process of quitting rather than on the static entity of the smoker and the potential future, future non-smoker. What we are emphasizing is the process of quitting both entities are in that process at the same time. By understanding the world through a verb-based language that prioritizes becoming and process over being in static states, Gross argues that Rob can be both his future and present selves simultaneously. It is a world of quantum superposition in which a person is and is not something at the same time. Back to Atwood. This quantum simultaneity is evident not only in the blurring together of the milliseconds in the eons, but again in the five times repetitions, which links time to materiality of space. What I mean is this tense scene links the physical beings in their moment of mutual vulnerability to a moment that encompasses all of their past, all of their present, and potentially all of their futures simultaneously. Toby's vision is more aligned with an Ojibwe perspective of cyclical time, where the past is contained in the present and in the future, all of which rub together simultaneously in the process of life, that is, in the process of creation. Toby's description of the scene that it is full to bursting is, I argue, a synecdoche, a part which comes to represent the whole. Here, the part in this moment which expands fractal-like across time and space, drawing all times and all participants together in a single moment and in all the moments of creation. If you're thinking, what has she been smoking lately? I've been reading a lot of Ojibwe philosophy and it gets complicated, but it also starts to involve uh, quantum worldviews. So, in explaining creation and adhering to Mino Bamatsuin, Darcy Rule states, quote, creation is not simply a conglomeration of all that exists, known and unknown, but it is the harmony that is found in both the total collection of all that is and the human beings themselves. By this, I mean to say that each individual, human and non-human, is as much a representation and manifestation of the whole of creation as the whole of creation is a representation of itself. Perhaps this is a lot to take in. I hear you. Very simply, if you are here, you are a part of creation. Just as the asinig, the rocks, the wabozig, the rabbits have a gift, so do you. 
And your respect for these gifts and the respect for the gifts of others is supporting the balance of creation. Creation is here in us, in you, in this room all the time. And it is created in our respect and our balance for the rest of creation around us. That is the entirety of creation at the same time that creation is the entirety and the balance of our known universe. Creation viewed this way is a fractal. It's a self-replicating pattern where the pieces of it are the same as the whole of it. So just imagine yourself as one of those triangles and creation is a big triangle. And as it moves and expands and moves in and out, you realize it's all the same thing, even though they are distinct parts to it. The pattern expands and contracts repeatedly through all that it is and all that is within it. So Toby's repetition, life, 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 is a profound realization of the fractal interconnectivity of creation across space, time, and being, as she connects this moment to all the moments and one being with all the beings. Importantly, though, she only receives this realization by ingesting a toxic plant and meeting the gaze of a non-human other whom she had previously viewed as an antagonist. She is brought outside of herself by the other who then awakens herself back to herself. She is becoming Toby. She's Tobying. The description of Toby's vision is representative of what Anishinaabe elder Edward Benton Beneiban describes as Dabasindizowin, or humility, which is one of the seven grandfather teachings of Minobamadzowin, to know yourself as a sacred part of creation. The vision that she receives is not the vision she intended initially saw it. She saw one of angels and gods speaking in a language that she understood. Yet, the vision that comes to her comes to her from plants and animals speaking a language she can't speak, but which she nevertheless understands. And this vision radically reframes both the structure of the novel and her understanding of living in a post-apocalyptic and post-anthropocentric world. There is so much more, so much more that could be said as a result of this impactful scene, but I want to be brief and get close to the conclusion. So very simply, one important thing that changes, Toby stops eating meat. She stops eating meat because she says she just can't after the communication with the pig. But instead of attempting to anthropomorphize or translate the pig's message, Toby likens it instead to natural processes. She says, quote, she couldn't, there we go. She couldn't put it into words. It was more like a current, a current of water, a current of electricity, a long subsonic wavelength. By describing the pig's communication in nature-based similes, Toby links the pig, the sender of the message, and herself, the receiver of her message, with the rhythm and the movement of the world around them. As for the Ojibwe, the world, for Toby, is in flux and she doesn't try to reduce to a human-centric understanding what the pig said, or more simply, she doesn't try to put it into words what the pig said, she leaves it as is. Next important change, the human survivors and the pigs form a truce to wage mutual war against their shared antagonists of a serial rapist who have been harming and killing members from both communities. That truce sticks through the rest of, this, uh, of the novel. Spoiler alert, my bad. The binary alternating structure format is also disrupted, but in a way that is distinctly different from the previous two novels. The first two novels collapse the alternating past present voices into one voice in the present. The third novel also ends with one voice, but it's a new third voice, Blackbeard's. This is significant because the Quakers are capable of communicating in ways that humans are not. Thus, Blackbeard integrates into his narrative messages from the non-human survivors, messages from the Quakers, from the pigs, and other metaphysical beings, such as the book, the song, the writing. These are all agential figures. The one voice, then, is many voices and is representative of a post-anthropocentric community. So overall, Matt Adam reforms the structure and offers a clear illustration of a community enacting a non-anthropocentric moral structure, indicating to its readers, indicating to its members, how they can walk the way of the good life in this very peopled universe. So, in closing, 
I want to highlight one final aspect about the epiphany between Toby and the Sao. If you remember, it occurs immediately after Toby's disappointing realization that the Christian God she was encouraged to believe in was magic or child's play. In an interview with her eventually to become husband, Graham Gibson, Margaret Atwood stated that in Canada, Christianity is an imported or fake religion, which directs its followers to, quote, destroy what is in the place and to make a replica of the God's place. In contrast, she argued that the only sort of good, authentic kind of thing to have is something that comes out of the place where you are or the reality of your life. However, she claimed that the authentic religion of the Canadian landscape had been destroyed. It can be assumed that the authentic religion of Canada, which she refers to, is that of the First Nations, the Inuit, and the Métis people. But far from being destroyed, that religion and indigenous philosophies were resurging across North America in 1973. In the same year that Atwood stated that the authentic religion of Canada was destroyed, Standing Rock Lakota philosopher Vine Deloria Jr. published God is Red, a Native View of Religion, in this phenomenal text. He suggests that the traditions, beliefs, and customs of the American Indian people are guidelines for mankind's future, specifically because they come from a particular experience and relations stem from a particular place. Far from being destroyed, native religions, languages, and worldviews across Turtle Island were blossoming in 1973, and they continue to blossom today, inspiring students, teachers, and elders to reconsider our responsibilities within a seven-generational worldview. To be clear, in this talk, I don't mean to pick on Margaret Atwood. I am an immense fan of her as a, as a person and an immense fan of her work. Rather, it is precisely because of her potentially now outdated views and because of her preeminent position among Canadian novelists that her work is ideal to view through worldviews which were for far too long ignored, marginalized, or silenced, even at times by authors such as herself, as we saw in Surfacing and Survival. But it seems to me that if we look at these two texts, Atwood and Deloria are saying similar things. Atwood wants Canadians to discover a way back to Canada's authentic religion as a means to preserve the land that we call home. Vine Deloria states indigenous traditions are the way forward for humankind. Let's take these big ideas, which could apply to all of society, but let's apply them here now to academia. As scholars, we do not need to turn to Euro-American critical views, which often reiterate as new, the philosophies and worldviews which have been voiced on Turtle Island for generations. Instead, by respectfully and carefully engaging with these worldviews, native and non-native scholars alike can recenter indigenous philosophies into a critical academic discourse which so sorely needs this intervention. More broadly, recentering native worldviews like Minobamatsuin and social discourse also offers, I hope, a small step in the necessary work of academic and social decolonization. So in closing, I hope these stories offered today inspire you to search for your own way of the good life as we all walk the shared path towards reconciliation. Mi'eyu and Megwich. Thank you very much. That was great, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. And in the next few minutes, what we're going to do is we are going to have a question, uh, open up the panel to a question and answer period. Oh, Catherine, are you going to run around with the microphone? Awesome. That's brilliant. Um, before we do, I would also like to make, uh, while you are germinating your questions, I would like to make a quick announcement. Uh, there is another, uh, we do have one more um, colloquium coming up on Friday, March the 22nd, which is Joy Googler. Uh, who will be talking about time traveling through the portal, which will be fantastic. So, um, while we are here, can we please, uh, does anybody have questions for uh, Dr. Brady? Take, take the microphone, there we go. Questions, comments, ideas, thoughts? Oh, just right up there.
Okay. <laughs> um, Geogrich, it's Mr. Jess, Tom, all his best on show. Um, hello, I'm Jess, and um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm with um, Professor Grover. Um, I offer you a couple of words in my native Irish language um, because I find so many similarities with the Ojibwe um, language. Um, native Irish people are a land-based animist people as well. And um, an example would be, we have 32 words for the word field. And that depends on what season it is or what animal is on this piece of land. Um, so I really, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed um, that piece at the beginning. I do have a question, I promise. <laughs> um, and another, another piece is um, when in Irish, when we say, I'm sad or I'm happy, the, the literal translation is actually, I have happiness on me. I have sadness on me, which honestly can take a lot of people a couple of years in therapy <laughs> to figure that out. Um, but my question to you is, um, what has been your um, feedback from the Ojibwe people um, on your work? So it's a great question. It was a question I was most terrified to receive every single time I present this information. Um, overall, well, very. If it, if it hadn't been received well, it wouldn't. I wouldn't keep doing it. Um, but I made sure I had an Ojibwe Moen, a very well recognized Ojibwe Moen speaker, knowledge holder, poet on my uh, defense panel, and she was really the only one. Like. <laughs> If my other external examiners are listening to this, like no offense, but I'm sure you understand, she really could have made or break, broken the dissertation. And her feedback in, in general was there were a couple of things I spelled a couple of words incorrectly. And I was like, oh, but like it's, it's an oral language and spelling is very, but she's like, no, you're spelling them wrong. It's like, okay, fair. Um, otherwise, she said very clearly at the end of her speech with me, her talk with me of you're doing it well, keep going. And so that I kind of hold that because I wouldn't keep doing it if I thought I was doing harm, if I thought I was doing something that the community wasn't appreciative of. I've presented it at several other indigenous specific conferences, um, pieces of or developments of this idea. And I think overall people are a surprised to hear a non-indigenous person doing this kind of work. Um, but mostly the question that I get, and again, I'm sorry to Margaret Atwood, mostly the question I get is why Margaret Atwood? And so that's why I wanted to kind of flip in like, I hear you, she can be a bit polemical sometimes, but she has changed that. And I think she's really reflected on her work in the past. She's written Pauline, which is a, an opera about E. Pauline Johnson, um, a very well-known indigenous poet of the earlier 1900s, I believe. Um, she has incorporated in Anishinaabe figures into some of her graphic novels. So I do feel a little, like I'm being mean by pointing out the stuff that happened in the 1970s and again in 2017. But I do think overall, like she is being much more respectful of what's going on. So that's really been like the biggest thing. But overall to your question, how has it been received? Generally very well, otherwise I wouldn't keep doing it. How many of these have you like done going to the different areas or is this one of your earlier ones? Like how many colloquiums like this one have you done before where you speak? Oh, okay. I mean, I've done, I've done, can you hear me if I just stand like this and project? Okay, I've done plenty of conference presentations. I have taught this material for several years, uh, but like to have you know this type of seating and lights and stuff going on behind me, this is the very first one. Why was it obvious? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joy, you had something about the yeah, hi, Bryn. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'm wondering how it was received in the center of Europe, otherwise known as Switzerland. Uh, it's Switzerland to 
from my department, the reason why I got started on this work in the first place, because I agree because I like science fiction, and my uh, mentor, supervisor, Deborah Madsen, who's written extensively on uh, Native American worldviews, especially the work of Louise Erdrich and others, she handed me my first novel by Louise Erdrich called Antelope Woman, which to some of my students here you've now read. Um, there is a, a pretty robust and very niche field of uh, Native scholars working in Europe. Uh, there are some excellent scholars that I work with in Germany, my own department, uh, one or two also in Switzerland. But it's understandably, it's not you know the major topic that we're all talking about. It's not Shakespeare. And so generally, when I would talk about this with my colleagues, I got the sense that there was a very respectful hesitancy to say something wrong. And so sometimes the questions would kind of come out all, all garbly, and I would have to be like, can you just say it? Just say the thing that you were asking about, and then we can work from there. And if you've said something terribly offensive, like, we'll work through that, it's okay. But like, you don't, you don't need to be afraid to speak simply because you don't know what you don't know. But otherwise, like, it was, it was quite popular. People were really interested in it. Uh, there is a lot of Native American interest across Germany, which can sometimes take the form of pretending to be Native American, which is really problematic. But from what I've heard from Native people in the United States and Canada, they think it's kind of funny and like, a bit strange. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of powwows in Germany. Great. Thank you so much. The question is over here. Uh, hello, I'm not, I don't have a, a question, but I just wanted to uh, make a comment. I think that um, language is utterly fascinating and I, I, it's one of my personal interests. Um, and the way that you described uh, Ojibwe as a quantum language really st uh, stuck out to me because um, quantum, like quantum mechanics or quantum sciences are something that's seen as very much like the cutting edge of, of academia. And it's interesting to me that uh, conversely, a quantum language like Ojibwe is something that, you know, young, young children are going to be picking up very quickly and communicating in in just the like standard practice. And I think it's interesting that the idea of something that kind of is and always and will be and has been um, is like the current pinnacle of Eurocentric sciences. And then conversely is the standard every day of people uh, in a completely different part of the world. Oh, perfect. Let's see if I can do this without causing reverb. Um, I agree. So when I first started reading about the Anishinaabe language, I was I, it's very hard. And there are some excellent books. If anybody's interested, I can show you or give you the titles. Um, well, they're already up here anyway. Um, Lawrence Gross's book, Anishinaabe Ways of Knowing and Being, that's the book that had the quantum chapter that I told you about. This has an excellent chapter just about the Ojibwe language in terms of how it works with verbs and nouns. Um, this one down here, Darcy Riold's book, I quoted him at length. This is a much more philosophical text. So if you want kind of like the more, how does the language actually work, go with this one. This is a phenomenal text. Um, but yeah, so when I first started reading about Ojibwe Moen and trying to figure out how it worked and what that means and how it impacted things, I think it was this idea of stuff is always in a, in a constant state of flux. So the book is currently blue, but it could eventually become brown and decay, and, and that's also part of the state of the book. So we're moving away from this idea of essential characteristics. The thing that the uh, example that Lawrence Gross provided, which I then put into the talk, was one that I thought was really impactful to me because he's talking about people later on. He talks about people with addictions. So the person that he mentioned, Rob, who wants to quit smoking, in English, he would be Rob, the smoker. That is his essential characteristic. It's an unchanging attitude. It's an unchanging adjective. He is the person who does that thing. And that thing then comes to define him. Versus if we rephrase it with an Anishinaabe perspective, depending on the order of words, in Anishinaabe Moen is free. You can move words around as you need. You don't need subject, verb, object, or object, verb, subject. You can move it around. Also, sometimes the subject isn't even named in the sentence because it's made clear with a suffix that's attached to the verb. And so what this means is the speaker can emphasize that Rob is doing something, 
but the speaker can also emphasize by moving the verb to the front of the sentence that there is a thing going on, which is the act of quitting smoking, and Rob is participating in that act. And so instead of calling him, oh, Rob the smoker, who's not yet a non-smoker, we instead have Rob is engaging in the participatory action of non-smoking. And I just found that as such a more compassionate way of viewing things, because if we talk about addiction in English, in our like anti-addiction training, we say, oh, the important thing to do is to name that you are a drunk. So I am a drunk and I will always be a drunk. That is just who I am. I think an Anishinaabe perspective is far more compassionate, which is I am this person who's always in the process of becoming and the becoming that I'm working on right now is not drinking. And so it's just a much more compassionate worldview by viewing yourself not as a static entity that might need to change, but instead an always continuing process that will struggle and sometimes fail, but the process continues on anyway. So that was the thing that I got from Lawrence Gross. It was one of those books where I had to like sit down for a minute and be like, oh, strongly recommend. It was so good? Okay. Oh, there's. Um, was it the, when you stepped away from the book to start preparing about the, with this Ojibwe course, um, was it the, the pig scene in particular that, that your mind went back to where you made that connection? To you to use um, the like the Ojibwe language in uh, in, a, in looking at Atwood's book, Matt Adam. Right, right, right. Um, in terms of the pacing, I had to stop because I had a I had a course to teach coming up in two months that needed to be taught, and I currently didn't have enough material to teach it. And so my sabbatical now was over. I had spent my sabbatical six months plus my summer vacation of three months. I had failed wildly. I had absolutely nothing to show. And I was like, my mentor, my supervisor is going to kill me because I was supposed to have produced a whole chapter during this period of time. And I got nothing. And I'm like, well, you can't fail at your class because regardless of what happens, a class is going to happen. So I was like, heartbreak, put things down, put it away, move on. Yes, you have failed. I am a Bryn in the process of failing. And... I moved on and I went and I studied my Ojibwe stuff. I thought about my Ojibwe stuff. I was working I was working on Erdrick and planning out the classes. I'm seeing like what stuff that we wanna talk about, what are ways that we can use this in the class conversation. But then when I step away from my desk and I go and I take a shower, I walk with Bonnie, I do, I make dinner, all this stuff when I think my brain is not actively occupied with work, that's when your brain is actively occupied with stuff that you didn't mean to think about. And all of a sudden, I'm like still kind of like thinking through with Margaret Atwood stuff. And all of a sudden, like the Erdrick stuff that had been front and center in my mind is like, hey, can we help? Can, can we help with that? Because like that, it's kind of like this. And I just kind of thought about those things on the weekends during the shower more and more and more until all of a sudden, about halfway into that semester, I was like, oh, I have an idea. Damn it. I wish I had my sabbatical back. But like, that's how it happens sometimes. So like failure is sometimes the best thing that can possibly happen. It made my dissertation what it actually ended up being. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, another one right there. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering how, after going through this process of interpreting the books through the Njibwe Moen lens, how do you now, when you're going forward reading non-Indigenous uh, literature, do you find that you instinctually now use an Njibwe Moen lens to kind of interpret it, or do you fall back on Eurocentric kind of connections? It's a good question, Morgan, and I wish you hadn't asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Good question. Simply because of the time constraints. So then when I left Geneva and I got this job here, I had a whole bunch of new courses to teach. And I didn't really know at my old university, it's much more like categorized in terms of who gets to teach what. And so as an Americanist or a North Americanist, I was allowed to teach the Native American work. But because I wasn't a professor hired to teach specific things, I didn't think I was supposed to be teaching Native American stuff. So the first couple of years that I was here, I didn't. 
because I was like, well, I don't want to step on people's toes. That's not like my job. That's not, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing here. So I went back to my kind of traditional mode of reading of I was doing science fiction work. I did always in every one of my literature classes integrate indigenous literatures and worldviews into the class. And I did kind of cheekily say to my students, like, if this seems like a good idea by this uh, Cherokee philosopher that we're reading and you want to apply it to, you know, Island of Dr. Moreau, that would be a great idea. But I myself haven't really been doing that strictly because I haven't had the time. Um, now that I know that I can do that, that it is available to me, that, that there is that flexibility in the department, then yes, then this is what I would like to be doing is reading, for instance, that very thing that I just talked about, but some of you were like, I'm gonna write about it. If you wanna write about the island of Dr. Moreau from a Cherokee perspective offered to you by Daniel Heath Justice, I think that'd be a super interesting and cool reading. So um, but my point is like, yes, I can do it, but so can you, if you are interested in a particular tribal worldview, if you are yourself of a particular tribal community and you know this stuff inherently, don't silo it into we can only use this worldview for native books. You can, and I think you definitely should move that worldview out and establish it as a valuable, conventional, critical lens. But if you are not of that community, then there is a little bit extra work that you need and that you should be doing. And if you do want to do that and you're scared about it, you have any questions, you can always come and see me because I like I've made mistakes. I have failed at times. Like we learn from our mistakes. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brin. I really appreciate it. What a, an amazing topic and really, really appreciate your time today. That was awesome. Thank you, Ant, and thank you to everybody for coming out. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. A couple of small housekeeping um, issues as we come in. Uh, Joy, you had a, something you wanted to talk about? together to find another date for uh, the Gustafson point, uh, which would be fantastic. And also, please, uh, because I was told I was allowed to, one last shameless plug. We have a show coming up called Puffs, Seven Increasingly Eventful Years at a certain school of magic and magic that opens on March the 7th. Please make sure to keep an eye out, look for posters, and come and see that as well. Please join us out in the lobby. We'll have some coffee and biscuits, and we can continue our conversation uh, with Dr. Bryn. And this is wonderful. Thank you so much for everything, and thank you for coming out. Have a great time.